Hello, everyone. I'm Hanana Akrami, a PhD student at Max Planck Institute for Informatics. This is a joint work with Noga Alan from Princeton University, Bhaskar Chaudhry, Jugal Garg, and Ruta Mehta from UIUC, and my supervisor, Kurt Malhar. Generally, in fair division problems, the goal is to divide a set of items among a set of agents in a fair manner. Now, depending on what properties we assume these items to have and what notion of fairness we consider, we can address a very wide range of problems. The items, for example, can be desirable or undesirable. Let's say in the case of divorce settlements, we are dealing with desirable items, who should get the car, who should get the house, etc. But in the case of uh, dividing household chores, for example, we are obviously dealing with undesirable items. Moreover, these items can be divisible or indivisible. For example, we can have divisible goods like a cake or money, or we can have indivisible goods like a set of electronics. We cannot simply break a laptop into half and give different pieces to different people. Each item as a whole must be allocated to one person. The same story holds for the case of undesirable items. And as for the notion of fairness, there are two main categories, envy-based notions and share-based notions. Uh, in this work, we focused on envy-based notions, which means that the agents find the allocation fair through comparing their bundle with other agents' bundles. Now, some examples of envy-based notions are envy freeness, EFX, EF1, and many more. And basically, in this work, we studied um, fair division of indivisible goods, assuming that our notion of fairness is EFX, which I'm going to define later. So formally, we are given a set of N agents, let's say these two, and a set of M indivisible goods, let's say these. And we are also given valuation functions VI for each agent I, which shows how much this agent likes each subset of the goods. And we, for now, we assume that the valuation functions are monotone, which simply means that adding a good to a bundle would not uh, cause the value of that bundle to drop. So this is the input, and the goal is to find a fair allocation of the goods to the agents. And an allocation is simply a partitioning of the goods into n bundles, x1 up to xn, so that xi would be allocated to agent i. Now, as for the notion of fairness, I mentioned that we consider envy-based notions, and a very um, famous one is um, envy-freeness which as the name suggests means that no agent should envy another agent. So basically no agent should strongly prefer another agent's bundle over hers. So formally VI of XI should at least be as much as VI of XJ for all agents I and J. Now it's not difficult to see that when the items are indivisible, envy free allocations do not always exist. A very simple counterexample is when we have two agents and one item which is valuable to both of them. So to whomever we allocate this, uh, this item, and the other agent uh, would be envious. So this brings us to uh, relaxations of um, envy freeness when we are dealing with indivisible items. And um, one famous relaxation introduced by Karagiannis et al. is envy freeness up to any good or EFX. So under EFX, an envy from let's say agent I to agent J is allowed, but any such envy must be eliminated upon the removal of any good from the envied bundle. So formally, it means that VI of XI should be at least as much as VI of XJ minus G for any good G in XJ. Now, if you look at the example that we had before, which was not NV free, it is indeed EFX because although one person, one agent is envying the other one, this envy would be removed upon the removal of any good, namely the apple, from the envied bundle. All right, now the question is, do EFX allocations always exist? And we do not know the answer to that question. And we do not know the answer to this question in spite of a significant effort by the community to resolve EFX problem. So it seems to be a very challenging problem, uh, whether EFX allocations exist or not. Now, the question is, how can we attack this, this challenging problem? Well. Um, one way would be to consider special cases, for example, the case that n, the number of agents, is a small. One line of research focused on EFX with charity, which means that we allow a small subset of goods to remain unallocated, but we guarantee an EFX allocation of the other goods to the agents. 
So these two ways are the ones that we considered in our paper, and I'm going to talk more about them. But of course, these are not the only ways to, to attack EFX. Um, a lot of, uh, lots of great work has been done already on, um, on EFX. Um, for example, when we want to achieve approximate EFX allocations, or when we consider special value, when we assume that agents have special valuations. Um, I simply cannot cite all of these works, but what I'm going to do is to focus more on the first two ways that I mentioned. So for the case that um, n, the number of agents is a small, Plot and Rough Garden prove that um, when there are two agents, EFX allocations um, always exist, and there is basically no restriction on the valuation of these, these agents. They can have general monotone valuations. Now, the problem gets significantly more challenging and more difficult when there are three agents. So in a breakthrough work, um, Chaudhry, Garg, and Melhorn proved the existence of EFX allocations for three agents when the agents have additive valuations. Then this result was improved to the case that um, the agents have nice cancelable valuations by Berga, Cohen, Feldman, and Fiat. I'm not going to define nice cancelable valuations. For the sake of this talk, all that matters is that it is a strict superclass of additive valuations, but still uh, more restricted than monotone valuations, general monotone valuations. So this was the state of the art prior to our work. And what we proved was that EFX allocations exist for three agents. Uh, and the only requirement that we have is that one agent has a nice cancelable valuation function. And basically, there is no restriction on the valuation functions of the other two agents. Uh, so this way, we basically improve the state of the art. And I'm going to um, also focus on uh, the simplicity of, of our analysis later, which compared to the previous works, our, our analysis and our algorithm is significantly simpler. Now, um, I also mentioned EFX with charity. I'm going to say a few words um, about it. So when, when we have EFX with charity, it means that we are allowing a subset of goods to remain unallocated. And we can say that, okay, assume that we are giving the subset to charity. But of course, we do not want to have all the goods to remain unallocated. Um, in some sense, we want to guarantee some notion of efficiency. So this line of work um, was initiated by the work of Karagiannis et al, who uh, proved the existence of EFX allocations with charity. Um, and as the notion of efficiency, they guaranteed um, half of the optimal next social welfare for the for the allocate for the EFX allocation that um, that they are giving. Then Chaudhry et al um, initiated this line of work of also bounding the number of the goods that we are giving to charity. Uh, and they prove that EFX allocations in which at most N minus one goods remain unallocated exist. And remember N is the number of agents, uh, which most of the time is assumed to be significantly smaller than the number of items. Then this result was improved um, to the case of um, N minus two un uh, unallocated items. And as long as we want exact EFX, that is the state of the art. That's what we know. But another way of attacking this problem would be to say that, okay, we, we allow some approximation of EFX instead of exact EFX. If we allow that, can we get a better um, uh, bound on, uh, on this efficiency notion? So basically, if we relax the fairness notion, can we get better efficiency? And the answer is yes. Chaudhry et al. Um, studied um, approximate EFX with uh, sublinear charity, sublinear number of unallocated goods. So first of all, approximate EFX means like one minus epsilon EFX means that uh, VI of XI should be at least as much as one minus epsilon times VI of XJ minus G for all G and XJ. So basically the definition EFX that we had before is one EFX in these terms. Now, what Chaudhry et al. proved was that if uh, if we consider one minus epsilon EFX, then they can bring uh, the size of the charity um, to a sublinear bound. So they they prove um, the existence of one minus epsilon EFX allocation 
with order of um, n over epsilon to the power of four over five unallocated bits, which, which asymptotically is better than n minus two. Now, what we did was an improvement on, on this last result. We also, um, we also obtain one minus epsilon EFX allocation, but we give a better bound on the number of unallocated goods and namely O tilde of N over epsilon to the power of one over two. And O tilde means that we are ignoring log factors. So these are basically our main results. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to um, focus on the first result. So what previously was known for um, three agents. Well, I already said that the existence of EFX uh, allocations for three agents was known for additive and nice cancelable evaluations. And these work um, have more or less the same approach. Namely, they start with an empty allocation. Then what they do is that they move in the space of partial EFX allocations. And partial means that some goods might be unallocated. Some goods might go to charity. And while moving in this space of partial uh, EFX allocations, they improve a certain potential function. And then they terminate when they reach a complete allocation. And complete means that all goods are allocated. Now, well, in, in this, um, this way, basically what they are maintaining throughout the algorithm is the EFX property of, of the allocation. And in some sense, in each step, they are improving this, this allocation. With, with this potential function that they have until they reach a complete allocation on, until all the goods are allocated. And then therefore in the end, they have a complete EFX allocation. Now, some drawbacks of this approach is that it fails even if one agent has general monotone valuations. So the analysis um, heavily depends on all agents having additive or nice cancelable valuations. And also it fails when uh, there are at least four agents. And Chaudhry et al. proved that it fails when there are at least four agents. By giving, by giving an example consisting of four agents in which there is a partial EFX allocation. And from this partial EFX allocation, there is no way to reach a complete EFX allocation through this potential argument. So what we did instead was that we move in the space of complete allocations instead of partial EFX allocations. Again, we improve a certain potential function and we terminate when we reach an EFX allocation. So this is basically the high level difference that our approach has compared, compared to the previous ones. And what we get is that our algorithm works even if two agents have general monotone valuations. Um, whether it works for four agents or more, of course, is still an open problem, uh, an open question, but um, at least there is hope that it could be extended to this case as well. And as an add-on, we also get a simpler analysis compared to the previous works. So previous works um, use these notions of envy graph, um, champion graph, and so on. And our approach basically do not require any of these um, tools and techniques. So um, in order to give you a high level idea of our algorithm, first let's start with a, with a simpler problem. Let's say that we want to divide a cake, which is a divisible item among two agents instead of three agents fairly. And here our notion of fairness would be envy freeness since we are dealing with a divisible item. So there is, a well-known uh, protocol to do that, which is called cut and choose. Basically, agent one, uh, we ask agent one to cut the cake into two pieces that he equally likes. And then we ask agent two to choose his favorite part. And this way we can basically give each agent a part such that both of them are happy with what they are receiving. And therefore we, we obtain an envy free allocation. Now, this um, techniques, this technique proved to be um, useful, even if we want to divide a set of indivisible goods among two agents fairly. And here, the notion of fairness would be EFX instead of envy freeness. And uh, well, again, what we do is that we ask agent one to cut, 
And here, what does cut mean? Well, we have a set of indivisible goods. So basically, we ask agent one to give us a partitioning of the goods into two bundles such that he would be happy, he would be fine receiving either of these bundles. And Platt and Rough Garden proved that such a partitioning exists. Then again, we ask agent two to come and choose his favorite part. And again, we can basically give the agents a bundle that, um, that they are happy with. So our idea was to generalize this cut and choose um, protocol to the case that we want to divide a set of indivisible goods among three agents fairly, and fairly meaning um, EFX. So again, we ask the first agent to cut uh, the, the resource, meaning that give us a partitioning of the goods into three bundles, such that she's happy receiving any of the bundles. Again, Plout and Rough Garden prove that such a partitioning exists. Now, already the problem is um, more challenging than before because we cannot just ask the second agent to come and pick his favorite bundle and go because his favorite bundle might also be the third agent's favorite bundle. So what we do is that we ask the second agent, which bundle or bundles are you fine receiving? And if we are lucky, he would answer with two bundles. He would be like, Okay, X3, let's say, is my favorite bundle, but I'm also fine receiving X2, meaning that EFX property would not be violated if I receive X2. And then we can ask agent three to basically pick his favorite bundle, because no matter which bundle he picks, we can obtain basically a perfect matching between these agents and, and the bundle, such that all the agents are happy with the, with the bundle that they receive. So sort of the bad case would be when the second agent says that I'm only fine receiving one of the bundles, let's say X3. And also the third agent says that, oh, I'm also only satisfied upon receiving X3. That's basically the only case that we cannot find a perfect matching between the agents and the bundles. And that is precisely where our algorithm starts. So as an initialization step, we ask agent one to divide the goods um, into three, three bundles according to her valuation such that she likes all the bundles uh, or she finds all the bundles fair. And then we assume that we are in this case that the second and third agent like both like one, one bundle. Now, the idea would be to alter this partition x1, x2, x3 and get another partition, let's say x1 prime, x2 prime, x3 prime but we maintain certain invariants, namely that the first two bundles are um, satisfactory to agent one, and the last bundle is satisfactory to at least agent two or agent three. So what we are doing is that we are moving in the space of complete allocations, or let's say complete partitioning of the goods into three bundles, but we are not moving very recklessly. We are maintaining certain invariants. And then we terminate when we reach an EFX allocation, namely when the corresponding graph uh, does have uh, a perfect matching between the agents and the and the bundles. Now, of course, the question is, why does this algorithm terminate? Why don't we revisit one state twice? And the answer is that we prove this through a potential argument. So basically, that was the high-level idea of our algorithm and all that I wanted to say about that. Um, I would like to end my talk with mentioning uh, two important open problems as future direction. Um, while talking about EFX, there are so many open problems and one can have a very long list here. But I would like to only mention two of them, namely the existence of EFX for three agents when all the agents have general monotone valuations and the existence of EFX for four agents. And the reason that I'm mentioning these two problems is that um, we hope that uh, the technique or the approach that we had um, could be useful in order to address these problems as well. At least unlike the previous approach, it has not been proven to not work for uh, for these questions. Let's say for, for the second one, we know that the, the previous approaches fail, but at least there is hope that um, this approach um, could be useful. Okay, with that, I would like to end my talk and thank you for your attention.